Um, okay, you're on. All right, great. Good afternoon. This is June 1st on a Tuesday and welcome to the first Empathy Surplus Congress. I am Anna Bruffy and I am the current president. Um, I will just do a quick introduction. I am a, um, a natural, a sustainable natural dyer of yarns and, and fibers. I am currently collaborating with the country of Guyana, trying to bring, bring back and keep the arts and crafts uh, alive. And I am also the new um, Chief Operating Officer for Sustainable Development Enterprises in Guyana. And we are trying to, uh, we are going to create micro, medium, and small business incubators to assist with the Guyanese diaspora. Um, Greg, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Greg Kennedy. I am Kennedy, the president elect of the Surplus, and I'm also a, an HR professional. Um, I live in Painesville, Ohio, and uh, I think that's about it for me. <laughs> Chuck? Uh, my name is uh, Chuck Watts. I'm your Zoom master uh, at the First Empathy Surplus Congress. Uh, I'm a uh, retired financial advisor with Edward Jones. Um, I live in Wilmington, Ohio with, with my wife. Uh, found, uh, founder and CEO of the Empathy Surplus Project Foundation. Uh, Anita? I'm Anita Lewis. Um, I'm a nurse, retired from the VA, but I keep my license up. And I work now in WASH, water sanitation and hygiene, here at our farm and also all the way down to Guyana. Uh, how about you, Miriam? Okay, I'm Miriam Spate. I live in Wilmington, Ohio. I'm the treasurer for the Empathy Surplus Project Foundation. And uh, I live on a farm with my husband. We've farmed for 40 years. And, um, oh, I'm a Quaker pastor. Great, great. Thank you, everyone. Chuck, would you, um, could you please pull up our four empathic uh, values? You, you bet. Let me, yeah. Uh... Find that real quick for us. Great, excellent. All right, our uh, Empathy Surplus Congress is a community of practice. Every day we promote the idea of stronger people, better futures, healthy government, love by and for people, mutual responsibility by practicing four empathic activities. We inwardly digest and use the latest brain insights of Dr. George Lakoff, his brain daily conversations to promote human rights, invest in weekly congressional hearings about how we apply Dr. Lakoff's insights to advance caring policy directions, implement caring policy directions in partnerships with businesses, effective government task forces, and other caring society organizations. And invite others to join us and promote a politics of care. Great, thank you everybody. Um, I would like to just discuss on how our last week was. And um, if you've made your emp empathic uh, impact on anyone. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll go, uh, I, uh, I'm excited about um, some conversations that I that I had last week. Uh, one was with uh, with the the staff of a uh, current uh, senator, uh, U.S. senator, who uh, are thinking about uh, thought leadership training, and uh, also um, the CEO of uh, a uh, an organization that focuses on uh, on road safety that I met uh, through the UN Global Compact uh, Givitas. They're both uh, interested in, um, in learning more about caring thought leadership training, especially the collective part. Um, and uh, so that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Greg, uh, what about you? 
Sure. So um, recently um, I uh, had a conversation with my father-in-law who is a Trump supporter and we had a, a debate for about an hour or more. And, um, you know, at the end, um, he said, you know, there's really nothing we can do about these issues that are going on. And I said, no, you're wrong. There is something we can do. And I said, you can be the change that you want to see in the world. And I can be the change that I want to see in the world. And he said, treat people right. And I said, exactly. I said, if you start with yourself and you treat others right and you get others to treat other people right, that's the start of it. And, and, and that's where, and that's where we, that's, we ended the conversation. He that's agreed. where it ended. Boy, that's a great place to end. Yes. Yes. So that is how I use the four empathic activities to um, encourage someone who had a different political view than I have to, to make a, a change for the better. That's, that's wonderful. Cool. Who do you want to go next? Oh, uh, Anita. Um, well, we continue facilitating the adaptation to American life of Wisdom and his family from Malawi. And um, they're doing well. It, it, it's, it's a long, hard road, though. Boy, it's, it's, it's tough. And it's complicated. But mm -hmm. we're, we're getting it done. Culture shock. Yeah, boy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When I spent three months in... Um, in Kenya, uh, my, my culture shock moment came about uh, about a month into it, you know, and, you know, uh, and, and I suspect that it happens to everybody when they're visiting a, a, a culture that's really different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, know, you, you yeah. Sort of come to a sort of a crashing awakening. <laughs> Yeah, uh oh, really. what's going on? I'm I, this isn't this isn't Kansas. <laughs> right, 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 right. I spent no. about a month in the Ivory Coast, and I had the same epiphany. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. How about you, Miriam? Okay, well, um, I prepared my message for Quaker Hour <clears throat> on the radio, and the message uh, was for, of course, the Memorial Day weekend. And um, so in the message I said about um, Memorial Day and how I mourned the loss of those who, you know, paid the ultimate sacrifice, but I also mourned the fact that our, our nation had failed to work out conflicts nonviolently. Um, you know, over the years, and that I, I hoped that we could uh, begin to work out conflicts uh, nonviolently in the future and not put our young men and women uh, in harm's way, uh, fighting uh, violent violence. So um, that's that was my message for Memorial Day weekend. And um, so that's how I applied. Cool. I um, <clears throat> for me personally, I attended a, a drum circle. I was invited to a drum circle at a, a new friend's house this past Wednesday, and I was able to hand out three handbooks and some of our pamphlets as well. So hopefully, um, hopefully, I'm reeling in some people's down here in Virginia Beach and Norfolk, and um, hopefully, we can start our own Congress down here. So very hopeful, and, and that sounds very promising. So it's I, wonderful. I forgot one thing too. Uh, I uh, uh, got invited to uh, Empathy Surplus Congress. Got invited to the Hillsboro Pride Festival. Oh, oh, wonderful! Uh, which is this Saturday uh, from three to eight, and uh, uh, I I ordered a new backdrop and uh, table cover. For uh, and, and so we're gonna we're gonna hand out pocketbooks at the Great. see if we can pick up some pick up some allies. 
That's great. Oh, um, yeah, wait, let me uh, interrupt here for a second. Um, I was speaking with the woman that used to run a, when she was professor at Wright State University, political science, and she was the, um, what do you call it, the UN? Oh, uh, you model know, UN? Yeah, the model UN, right. Model she ran the model yeah. UN for years. Okay, yeah. so she says next year, of course, we're here in Dayton, we're going to have the anniversary celebration of the Bosnian peace accords and all of these big, big wigs from all over the planet will be here. And I said, how can we get an invitation? She said, just join the, the peace museum. Oh. Join the peace museum. You'll automatically get a get an invitation. invitation. Okay. To that banquet next year. Oh, cool. Nice. So that's we, an, I, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Greg, did you have you gotten the pocketbooks yet? No. Man, I am bummed. I am really bummed out. So uh, yeah, I'm itching to uh, 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 to uh, take a road trip. I may just bring them up and and see you, but uh <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why, because because uh, uh, Dan says he he sent them. So um, how long has so, it been? So it's been. Uh, hang on a second. I'll tell you. It's really a bummer. Can you confirm the address that he used? Yeah. Let me look. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's what's going on. Marla was in the hospital last week too. I don't know if that. Oh, happened. really? Yeah. Wow. She's, you know, she's had trouble balancing her medication and keeping it. You know. Okay, thirteen sixty two Elizabeth Boulevard, Painesville, correct. Ohio, four four zero seven seven. That is absolutely correct. But I have not received any pocketbooks. Uh, Henry's and uh, oh, wait a minute. You know what? What? What happened? I misread it. It's on there. Put it on there on eleven, but I didn't put Dan on there. I put myself. So he didn't get the message. So he didn't get the message. Oh, okay. So, okay, okay. I'm sorry. That's, Man. That's all right. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just glad while, we got to the bottom of it. <laughs> yeah. And while I'm thinking about it too, uh, if you could, every couple, three days, whoever, whoever you're following up with, I think you're following up with Jamaica. Yes. Anybody else that you're currently following up with? Uh, Jamaica so, and that uh, Kimberly, didn't you, uh, Kimberly, I think Kimberly Wood Padilla. Hold on a second. Um, did you, so you wanted me to send someone to, to Kimberly as well? Did, did I, did I say that or not? Maybe I, I, I don't, I don't think so. I was looking through my emails. So, so yes, I did want to send, I did want you to send them. I should have been clear. And I'll send you, I'm going to send you, but if you could, you know, uh, maybe once a week, because they got four to six weeks. Right, right. You know, the clock is ticking, you know, because I haven't heard anything from Jamaica. Yeah, I just, I um, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I texted her earlier, I mean, maybe half an hour ago. She's in a meeting now, I think. But I did remind her, I said, can you please uh, set up your credentials for the Congress? I said, if, uh, if you don't, you'll, you'll be uh, blocked. <laughs> the time <laughs> <line>. <laughs> okay. you'll Time out. You'll time out. Time out. <laughs> no, but I did let her know. Yeah, I did let her know about how important it was to sign up. And it's only $10 a month, so. Yeah. Chuck, I don't, I don't see anything about Kimberly okay. as I'm looking through all of my emails here. Okay. I'll send you, I'll send you something. 
Okay. Quite possible that I missed it because I have, you know, I, I'm I am overwhelmed with emails. Like I have emails from my job. I have emails for empathy, empathy surplus, and then I have two other personal email addresses. And so I, I get overwhelmed by email sometimes. So <laughs> I have three as well. That's a lot. Uh, yeah. So you know, we didn't have a speaker today. No, we didn't. And um, I don't know if anybody got ready for today or not. I mean, I barely got something put together. I, I started my testimony. I, I just didn't finish it. I just didn't have a chance to finish it. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the way it goes. Yeah. yeah, this is an interesting chapter. Yeah, it is. It is. Right. So we are on chapter eight, 8.1 of our book, Your Brains on Politics. Mm -hmm. um, who would like to be Elizabeth and who would like to be George? I'd like to be Elizabeth. Okay. Put your up. <laughs> Just to shake things up a bit. Yeah, Take it up. Exactly. <laughs> Take it up. Who's gonna be who's gonna be George? I okay. can be I can be George. Oh good, good. Let Miriam be George. Okay. All right, Miriam. Good. good. <laughs> okay. Um words with no single meaning, communication and contested concepts. Um, 8.1, two lands of the free, why we hear what we think. In the name of freedom is the credo of the United States or of US American politics. Sometimes there seem to be quite a bit of friction between ideals and well, actions. Take for example, the positions of George W. Bush took during his presidency. He had the US attack Iraq in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He conducted extensive surveillance on citizens in the name of their liberty. And he rolled back social programs in the name of poor people's liberty to flourish. Under his presidency, some people say America must have forgotten the meaning of the word freedom. Not so. George W. Bush knew exactly what the concepts of freedom and liberty meant to him. He attacked Iraq in the name of freedom and he heartedly believed what he was saying. He spied on people in the name of liberty and he genuinely believed that it was crucial to take these measures to protect their liberty. He simply held an unapologetically strict conservative interpretation of freedom and liberty. It's a big mistake for progressives in the US to think that conservatives are simply misusing words such as freedom, liberty, or fairness in order to cover up unpleasant or inconvenient truths about their policies. That is naive and even dangerous. Bush meant exactly what he said when he was pursuing national and international policies in the name of freedom. You ask if America has forgotten the meaning of the word freedom? No, it hasn't. The problem is a bigger one. America has two entirely different understandings of what freedom means, a conservative and a progressive one. And no one talks much about this. So we have to ask ourselves, what does the word freedom mean? Freedom can mean all kinds of things and even contradictory things. What one person might see as freedom can be viewed and experienced by another as a restriction of freedom. And they would both be right. Words have no objective meaning. Our conceptual systems lend meaning to words. And these systems can differ based on the experiences we have had and the worldviews we endorse. We already talked about the fact that people commonly don't realize that the metaphors and frames they use impact their understanding of the word, world, and words immensely. One reason for why we are oblivious to these truths 
might be the ways in which we construe uh, concepts such as language, words, and communication. Most of us don't realize, and in fact, never bother to even wonder how communication really works. And we use metaphors for communication that make us blind to some very important truths about communication, such as the fact that words can have very different meanings to different people. I agree. For instance, while not all Americans share the same concept of freedom in their minds, we're inclined to think they do. And we tend to assume that all people understand words in the same way. And the reason that we do believe that words have objective meaning has largely to do with our metaphoric construal of communication. The metaphors we use in our reasoning about communication make us ignore the fact that words have no single objective meaning. So let's ask ourselves, what is the most common construal of communication? Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Would you like to have a say a word or a phrase that stands out for you in this chapter? Chuck, can yeah. you first? Uh, or Greg, fill, sorry. Fill in the blanks. <laughs> fill, fill in the blanks. Mine is, is my word or phrase. Okay. Greg. My phrase is the subjectivity of it all. Mm. Ada. Mine is rolled back social programs in the name of poor people's liberty to flourish. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that stood yeah. out to me too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Miriam. Um, mine is, that is naive and even dangerous. Oh, goodness. I can't really. I would actually like to pass. Okay. So I guess that's me then. Okay, so uh, I, did, I did write something. So if I can pull it up, find it. So um, where is it? I'll get there. Okay. There we go. So um, here I'll pull my timer up here. So fill in the blanks. In fact, Dr. George Lakoff wrote in Your Brain's Politics, we have to ask ourselves, what does the word freedom mean? Then we have to define what we mean when we are talking about freedom. Take our healthcare human rights talking points, for example. It gives several examples of connecting universal freedom to healthcare. First, are, are we free to receive lifetime quality comprehensive healthcare? Second, are we free to receive dignified hassle-free treatment? And third, are we free from fear of lack of public protections that protect and empower our health. Fill in the blanks, or as doctors Lakoff and Whaling say, reframing is social change. What about equitable freedom to healthcare human rights? First, are we free to choose our own doctor and hospital? As I was writing this, my kidney care doctor, uh, doctor's office called to see when I could schedule my annual visit and only have a kidney care doctor because my primary doctor referred me three years ago for something specific, which is now taken care of. The scheduler seemed so confused when I suggested that my annual checkups and blood work should now go back to my primary doctor. Second, are, are we free from unaffordable, cost, unaffordable costs? For example, I've got great Medicare, Medigap insurance, but not everyone does. Fill in the blanks. And what about accountability freedom that healthcare treated as a human right affords? Are we free from fear of privateers like <clears throat> ethical insurance companies or their cruel accomplices inside government? In fact, that disastrous duo deny care, cause suffering, cause financial ruin, and sometimes cause death, all for financial gain. Or what about being free from worry 
about being paid or treated fairly if you are a doctor or a healthcare provider? Why do they have to have dozens of clerks just to get paid? Or are we free to do process in a court of law with no compensatory caps for redress of grievances and harm because of un unsafe healthcare practices? There are lots of ways to fill in the blanks on freedom if we will use healthcare talking points on the back of our healthcare photo petitions. So, Greg? It's all you, Greg. You're muted. You're still muted. I just realized I was muted. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm, I'm on the right path now. <laughs> okay. The subjectivity of it all. I think it's funny that Dr. Lakoff states that words have no subjective, no, no objective meaning. And that's because it, it's true. That, that would also mean that reality and how we perceive things is also subjective since we use words to describe reality. So let's talk about the word freedom as mentioned in today's reading. Years ago, I had a debate with my brother and I don't mean that metaphorically, we do share the same mother and father and a debate with a fellow colleague of mine. The debate with my brother had to do with freedom. My brother's argument against iPhones is that iPhones restrict your freedom to do, to do certain things such as, um, they, they have a lack of an external memory card, whereas Android phones allow more memory or more freedom because they have an external memory slot. Uh, in addition, he stated that Android uh, phones don't track you as strictly as iPhones do. My argument is that the iPhone creates ease of use. I pick up an iPhone and I, I can pick up any iPhone and begin to use it without any training, so to speak, because iPhones are generally set up the same way. They have the same general framework. Android phones, on the other hand, um, have their own setup, depending upon the manufacturer, which requires a learning curve each time you purchase a new Android phone. In addition, um, I said, I don't care if iPhones are tracking me because I'm not doing anything wrong. So if I'm being tracked by someone, those people must be bored to death. And by the way, my brother isn't doing anything wrong either. He simply likes the freedom of not being tracked as much and the use of an external memory card. I prefer the ease of use, period. We both want freedom, but we have different perspectives on what that is and what it looks like. The second debate has to do with subjectivity or objectivity of reality. My colleague insists that there are certain things in the world that are objective and I insisted that nothing is truly objective. Without getting into details of this debate, my argument is that the only way that reality can truly be objective is if you can be in the mind of another person and experience everything exactly as they experience them through their senses. If you can't do that, then reality is subjective. This is where I stopped because I, I, I just didn't finish, but I was leading to a point here. And my point is, is that we don't have to have, we don't have to objectively agree on everything. We just have to uh, agree on some concepts that are good for everyone, whether or not we have, whether or not our perspective is the same or not. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, so Anita, I think, is third. Yes, I think Anita was third. Well, yeah, that was, that was really good, Greg. Yeah. Um, to me, well, freedom <laughs> is a state of being. It's a state that you're in, you know, it not. It's not the end point. Um, and man, I remember the George W. Bush years. And back in 2000, I was invited to be uh, 
on the uh, county soil and water conservation district board and um, which I continue to be on as an associate. Um, but <laughs> so for some meetings and trainings, we'd all load up in a van and drive to Columbus for the day or a couple days. And uh, oh my goodness, how quickly I found out that I was the only progressive in all of Greene County. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and would hear over and over again, coming back at me, freedom, yes, everybody has freedom. They've got the freedom to fail. You know, if they don't work hard enough, if they can't pull themselves up by the bootstraps, if, you know, it, it's, they're right that they have the freedom to fail. They have the freedom to fail. Just, and, and then that, that was it. These people could not understand any point at all about human rights. Um, and they fall in, what they would do is when we talk about the military too, and the thing that always sticks in my craw is uh, strategic air command. I don't even know if they're called that anymore. And their main slogan, which was peace is our profession and the home of the B-52 bombers. And <laughs> it's, I, I'm just so sick of living a life with prof other professional people where black is white, white is black, up is down. They, they just wiggle away from everything. And, and like it just, their justification for behavior always seems to come down to might makes right versus the King Arthur might for right. And that's, that's just pretty, pretty darn painful. So, um, and then when I joined Senior Rotary, it was just as bad. There, it, now, you know, I do have a few, <laughs> there are a few people in the county that I can reliably count on to talk to, but in general, I don't see any progress being made in Greene County opening up. Now, one last thing I, I do want to say, though, about... Yeah, about 30 seconds. Yeah, okay, so being biconceptual. I heard a talk a couple years ago by one of the federal judges and he said, and, and this was in a very conservative audience, and he said, well, the one thing that I've observed over the years that I can say is the higher people go becoming judges, the more liberal they become. And I thought, oh, that's <laughs> that's such a positive thing. I that's the one positive thing I ever heard in a lecture at Rotary. Anyway, that's that's okay, Miriam. Okay. Um, for what it's worth, at the end of this section eight point one, I wrote the word depressing. I find I find it depressing that. Um, you know, to to realize that they have their way of thinking, and we have our way of thinking, and it's almost impossible to change uh, their way of thinking. They have their their metaphors and their uh, what they uh, don't even know that they believe, and that's subconscious. But um, the The place I underlined is it's a big mistake for progressives in the US to think that conservatives are simply misusing words such as freedom, liberty, or fairness in order to cover up unpleasant or inconvenient truths about their policies. That is naive and even dangerous. And um, I, I guess I've been thinking a lot about what Chuck shared last time. Um, about freedom and um, 
Oh, and yesterday I was in the Walmart parking lot and there was a car next to mine and there was a bumper sticker that said, God guns Trump. And I, it just, it was so offensive to me, so offensive. And I just feel like I'm living in hell. You know, the, I'm, you know, these people are all evil around me. Uh, do I really want to walk into Walmart? Um, it just, I felt so out of place. But um, I don't know, something that Chuck said, and I can't remember exactly what it was last week. I've been thinking about, and I've been thinking about uh, people who support Trumps and their um, conservatives, and they truly believe in what they are doing is right. I mean, the insurrectionists truly believe what they did was American, very basic American uh, resistance. And, you know, sometimes I think, yeah, that's the way I felt back in the 60s and 70s. I was a resistor um, against the war, um, but they're resistors and they want to cause violence and war. So um, uh, it's, it's difficult, but the thing I've been thinking about is, is that um, for, some reason, for some reason, Trump and Trump is not the, the, the problem. It's all the people who voted for him and feel this way. And they felt like he cared about them. And you will hear them say that. Trump cares about us. He cares how we feel. But in the same token, I feel like he, he cares. He has helped, helped them to say all the bad things that they weren't allowed to say before, that they were you know, now they can say all their racist things and their horrible things like gun, God, guns, God, and Trump, and uh, they can be as evil as they want to be. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking this through, so I don't have a conclusion, but um, anyway, maybe the rest of this chapter will help me. I would like to say something. It Took me a minute after re, re, you know, after hearing y'all speak and then reviewing this chapter. And for some reason, I mean, I know we're talking about America, but for some reason, and I may be naive to this too, but Korea came up um, oddly enough, like North Korea, and and the reason why is because um, I believe. A while, a while back, 20, 30 years ago, that um, the North Koreans thought that everything was fair and they, they had the freedom, um, although they were treated poorly. And I mean, like I said, this is just my, my point of view, um, that when you see that because North Korea has been closed off for such a long time, like I said, they, they think that they have fairness and freedom, but they, they're not aware of it because they're forced to be that way. And, and I, it's not, I think of it's like brainwashing <laughs> when it comes to, to other countries and even Trump, you know, he really, you're right, Miriam, you know, he really gets in your head and he, he makes you feel like you are now able to truly express how you feel, um, you know, and, and, and I just, I think it's really, unfortunate but interesting on how the meaning of freedom applies to other countries as well when when they're not really free it's what they're being brainwashed into believing um so liberty fairness you know so what does that mean for each country what does that mean for each presidency you know the the trumpers you know think that they now have liberty you know and then we have biden you know we have freedom and fairness, and it's just, it's, it's, it's really interesting on the political um, views of this, so that's it, wasn't much, it <laughs> wasn't much to say, but that's what it reminded me of, so. So, has anybody read okay. this book? Uh, no. I got it. Who? Yeah, I have, I have. Who's free? Yeah, we did that last year, didn't we? Uh, it's been a while, but. Uh, <laughs> Here's, a, here's th almost 300 pages of, uh, of conversations about freedom. 
And, uh, you know, we've, we've only got about another uh, probably two months of before we either start over on our book or, or start something different. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I really like this particular book because it's small and it really gets right down to the, so I wouldn't mind starting over. It's a good idea. But I, um, you know, the, the, the thing that really bums me out about, <laughs> about yeah, uh, I'm reminded of a needlepoint uh, a picture, you know, needlepoint, frame needlepoint over my pastoral theology professor's desk that said, you shall know the truth and it shall piss you off. And, uh, <laughs> and, and what really bums me out is uh, this, this objectivity thing, you know, this, you know, why, why can't we just go to the dictionary and, and look it up, you know, uh, and, and what he's saying, which really turns our world upside down is, you know, I guess the dictionary gets to the, to that, the core meanings um, but they don't, they don't get to the, the lived meanings, the, the experienced meanings, the embodied meanings, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and so, um, what, what conservatives have done so well through, through, through the media, ha, you know, it has been to, uh, to frame the, the world that we experience through that media, you know, uh, from the conservative uh, set of values. And, uh, uh, and so if we have any, any chance at all of regaining our, um, you know, freedom, uh, you know, freedom to be treated well, you know, <laughs> Freedom to uh, uh, to uh, live in live in a progress in a uh, prosperous have some sort of of prosperity uh, that that uh, you know it's it's either so it, so the world is not you you know you you can either sink or swim you know I don't like the idea of a sink or swim world no no you know and uh, we, so if, we're, if we ever want a world that respects human rights, we really have to be talking about that world all the time. And, and when we use these loaded words, we have to unpack them every time we use them because people don't hear them the way we, we mean them. So we're, so we're always, we, you know, because we're behind the eight ball, we've got to take that extra time to, to say what exactly what we mean. And, uh, and, Chuck, and, and I, that's the truth and it pisses me off. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remembered what it was that you said, you were talking about do no harm and, or you were talking about how conservative uh, ways of thinking and policies do harm to people. And I thought, I've been thinking a lot about that this week. And so isn't, I, didn't I learn when I was a kid that you have the freedom to do, you know, what you want to do, but it, it can't do harm to somebody. You know, you're not, a, that, that's not true freedom if you're doing harm to somebody. And so that's the limit of freedom. You can't do harm. Well, obviously, we're, we haven't been very good in America of not doing harm. Tulsa, Oklahoma is one example. Um, but yeah, we need to talk a little bit like what um, Chuck was talking last week of, you know, this policy does harm to people. Uh, like the, the voter suppression policies that are being passed. That's harming people's 
you know, abilities to vote. They could be standing out in heat for hours and pass out from heat stroke. I mean, there's just lots of harm involved in it. And um, so we have to point those out and talk about it. All the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what I think, what I feel is my progressive friends, the progressives I know are optimists and the very conservative people that I know are basically pessimistic about life. And uh, it, it just seems like we come from these two different bases. And I think the optimism and pessimism are handed down, you know, through, you know, from our parents. Through, through we words. That. Through words. Sure, there's, and action ways of speaking. Yeah, there's yeah. ways of speaking. Right, yeah. right. Because uh, yeah, my family was very, very pessimistic, and was always saying something bad about them, the others, why we suffer. Blah blah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to mentioned something that um, Anna mentioned, and she talked about North Korea and how they are brainwashed to believe that they have freedom. And I wanted to share with you what my son said when he was in North Korea, because he was in the Marines. Um, of course, he was in South Korea, so, but he got a chance to you know, experience being in Korea. And, and when I asked him this, a similar question, he said, he said, um, they're not brainwashed. He said, very similar to what happened in the United States um, in the 60s and going further back. Everybody knew, it was, everybody knew slavery was wrong. Everybody knew um, that Jim Crow laws were wrong, but people just weren't willing to um, sacrifice their way of life. That people just weren't willing to go against um, what those in power had established. And that's what's going on in North Korea. Many of them know that they don't have freedom. Many of them know that some of the things that are going on is not right, but they're powerless. They have no power to change anything. They don't even have power to express uh, a, a contrary belief. So right. that's, that's, I think that's what's really going on over yeah. there versus, versus them being brainwashed. Yeah. Um, Dale made a um, funny comment to me um, within the last couple of weeks. He said that uh, he left the house and he locked the door. He locked me in. And um, I said, you locked me in. And he said, oh, that's for your own safety and protection. <laughs> because that's what you'd hear in Saudi Arabia when we were there. For your own safety oh, and protection. Oh. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the women got locked in. Yes, yeah. yes. So they could be have freedom from fear. Okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Words, words, words. Huh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That's very. That's a very interesting perspective. One. Uh, thing, one thing I want to say is <clears throat> to, to Greg. I. I'm just in. I, I'm very much in awe that you. Um, had that conversation with your father-in-law and that it ended the way it did. And, you know, those aren't easy conversations and kudos. I'm just saying kudos. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. So Greg, it, it, you as an independent when you're running for city council? Uh, how did you know that? Yes, I am running as independent. Yeah. Well, I'm I still trying because, to get... uh, because you missed the primary. Yeah, I did miss the primary. Yes, right. you knew that. <laughs> yeah. I did miss the primaries. But did you and miss so, it on purpose or? or uh... I, I, I did not miss it on purpose. Um, the problem has been that this process is, has been so confusing. Like now I finally have the right paperwork. Now I gotta go, I gotta go out in my neighborhood and get signatures. And I'm like, oh. Oh, it's just exhausting. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not even so sure get, if I can get you get signatures, signatures from from independents. Is that what you do? Or no, I have to get 50 signatures to get my name on the ballot. So it doesn't. So uh, well, just imagine if you had to get 50, you know, of a party signature. If you if you, yeah, you know, if you all you need <laughs> is 50 signatures, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so do they have to be residents of your city or they have they have to be residents of the city. <laughs> so. Oh, oh. so this gives you sort of a, a, a pre idea. Mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, you've got to. Uh, so so have you asked for the first signature yet? I have not. So um, what's your, I'm, I'm what's your elevator I'm, pitch going to be? <laughs> so my <laughs> my elevator pitch is, is typically what I normally say when I'm talking to people about empathy surplus. I, I want to promote and create a government of, for, and by the people. And I want that government to create policies and laws that are beneficial for everyone and not just one segment of people. Period. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, I, and I'll be honest. I don't know what that looks like. Okay, <laughs> I, I don't think anybody knows what that looks like. But that's but that's what I'm moving towards. And and if you, I suggest uh, that you do know what it looks. You'll know it when you see it. Right. Yes, I, I'll I know think, it when I see it. Yeah. Yeah, and we do have to sort of conjecture what it would look like. Right. And and right, so right. that you have a vision and uh, yes, because yeah, that's important. Yeah, I imagine it looks like this. People are being empathetic for with each other. People are caring for each other. People are taking responsibility, not only for themselves, but for other people. People are holding themselves accountable for what they say and do and holding others accountable for what they say and do. That's how I imagine it looks like. Yeah, yeah. So those, fit, those five sets uh, of three words mm -hmm. uh, will, will really help if you'll zero in on them uh, as you're as you're writing your pitch you've already got uh, you're already fluent in the in the first three yes yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I do struggle with the other two <laughs> yeah the other uh, the other four sets of three are uh, kind of, yeah. if you don't use them they, they're sort of you sort of yeah. forget about them yeah I do I do so I, I and I do that on purpose because you know, typically the, the brain, you can only remember so much. You can only remember so much. So I try to focus on three things. And if I can get subsets of those three, then I think that I, I'm fine. <laughs> so. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Chuck, we have four minutes left. Do you want to? I'm wanna pulling it up. up. I'm pulling it up here. Yeah. Okay, great. And I apologize. I left the meeting last week, so at the, at three, but I had a meeting to go to immediately after that. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we know. We totally got it. Yeah. Well, I'm a caring citizen. Yeah. Citizen. I, I occupy, I occupy I empathy. empathy. I hear. I hear. I hear all of the distribution no, under God. I have a, I'll have a new, have a new freedom. Of freedom. Government and the government, of the, government of the people, by the people, for the people, for the people, for the people shall not, not perish, perish from this earth. I am a person with human rights. I am a person, I am a person with human rights. I care, I care for my own safety and happiness and that of others. I am a solution to expanding life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Joining caring, caring, caring citizens, and known and unknown, to mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. All right. Good to see everybody. Right. Good to see you.